All right, thank, uh, thank you for uh, introduction and saying my uh, last name properly. Uh, it's, uh, it's not something I, uh, I hear often. Um, all right, so um, hi everybody. Thank you for uh, coming in uh, and uh, be, being willing to listen to this lecture. So um, today I'm gonna do a, a, a thing that probably not a lot of people that are um, uh, holding the mic uh, do and it's uh, ask you to take out your uh, cell phones and partic participate in this uh, in this lecture. So you're gonna have a chance to sort of do the voting and all of that, all all, kind of, all kinds of stuff. So you go to the menti.com and you use the code 20098, and you'll have the same presentation in front of you. And then uh, I'll give you some questions later on, and you'll, you'll get to answer them. All right, so um, it's a pleasure really to be here. Um, hopefully, I will be able to provide some, some valuable insight uh, for your work, uh, maybe for you yourself personally. Um, and I'm really open and, and, and looking forward to the discussion later because a lot of this is um, pretty, um, um, uh, it's, it's being uh, uh, put in the media uh, as as we speak, uh, and you'll 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 see what I'm talking about later. All right. So moving on. Uh, basically, uh, what do I do? I'm an evolutionary personality psychologist, right? So what does that mean? Um, I look at human personality and try to figure out <coughs> why are we the way that we are. And there's been a major shift in uh, psychology and personality psychology in the last maybe 25, 30 years. Uh, we used to think about ourselves and our behavior in this sort of an ether, you know, you would look at specific behaviors of people and then you would try to compare this to like, why did this happen? But and try to explain it in a little modulated way and then you would hope everything would stack up. But maybe 30 to 40 years ago, psychology, started going back to its roots, which is basically biology. So although in, there's a the big blank slatest movement um, in, in, like in the public opinion, thinking that, you know, sure, animals and all the other creatures are products of evolution, but we are really special. It's not about us. Or maybe my body is a product of evolution, but my brain certainly isn't. Turns out it's false. All the selective pressures that we as a species were put through in the millions of, of years that, that created us left traces. They left traces in the way our bodies are designed, um, like bipedal walk or lack of fur for some people. Um, not me. Uh, and actually, um, in the way that we see the world, that we uh, you know interpret the information that we get, um, some sex-specific differences uh, also uh, emerge as a consequence of us being a sexually reproducing person, uh, species and so on. So basically today, uh, we are looking at Darwin is, like, it's psychology versus technology. Um, Darwin being the first psychologist, you know, he, he, he had a vision of this. Uh, and, and, and the last, last um, uh, one of the, some of the last words in the Origin of Species is saying, I envision psychology in a hundred of years being based on evolutionary science. This is uh, actually what is happening versus technology. So we grew up in this very different environment than the environment that we live in today. Uh, and, but we're creating all of this fantastic landscape online uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a completely different in, in, in a digital environment. And what I'm, the idea that I'm going to try to promote today is that our ancestral drives and urges and our design is being translated even in this completely new digital world. So everything that made us human and left us um, um, uh, with a society, physical society that we have today, is being translated in a, in a digital sphere. And I'm, 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 I'll show you what I mean about uh, uh, with this uh, uh, tad bit later. All right, so take out your cell phones and I need you to answer a couple of questions, right? So the first one is, I feel comfortable being in the center of detention. So it's absolutely true, mostly true, neither true, not true, mostly true. All right, come on, there's, uh, there's more 15 of you there. Let's get the voting in, we need the votes. Uh, we need other votes. 
Okay. <laughs> and if you're illegal, you do not have the right to vote, okay? Okay, 30 people. So it's mostly true, so we got most, most, most people here are comfortable with the attention, okay? Moving on, do you get upset easily? And waiting for the votes. It should, uh, it, there's a, probably a lag with the internet. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, depending on the, uh, the bandwidth and, and all of that kind of. So getting upset easily. So, uh, let, let me explain this. So, like, are you the per kind of person that sort of sails calmly through the, um, um, uh, all kinds of problems that hit you in your life, or do you really get upset easily? Do you experience these negative emotions more often? Do you get thrown off track easily? Or uh, you know, are you be, do you handle stress well? This is what what this question is. Is it there? No. no. Dude, all right. Why is it not working? <laughs> I'm getting well. I'm kind of getting upset now at this point. Let me let me put this on. Wait, wait a second. Still still nothing. <coughs> That's impossible. You broke it. No. Seriously? Yeah. I don't know what worked last time. Are we online? What about now? Yeah. Yeah. This is this was on first. Yeah, now it works. Oh, All right. Okay. All right. Skip. Yeah. Getting through this. That's fine. I'm yes. not getting up. You know, I'm not, I'm that kind of guy that gets upset easily. So it's fine. It's fine. It's all right. Okay, it's a different question, doesn't matter. Do you, like, do you like to make other people feel good? This is the question that we're, uh, we're getting at, to now. <laughs> oh, good, okay, so you won't kill me if this, this doesn't turn out well, that's fine. All right, 56 <laughs> people voting, mostly true. So like, you, this, is, this is a question that sort of tries to get, if, if you're the kind of person that gets upset if other people are feeling bad, Right? Uh, you do you emphasize a lot with with, with the other? Uh, um, I, I think that's the word. Um, if other people are upset, um, you feel invested in their problems and all kinds of stuff like that. Okay, moving on. I leave my things everywhere. Is it working? Yeah. All right, perfect. So, are you the kind of person that is orderly? You know, finishes lunch and washes washes the dishes. Uh, the table is always in order. Every drawer has its contents that have to be in its place, that kind of stuff, all right. All right, so kind of 50-50, since a lot of people are, as many people aren't, but mostly yes. You can hide it, your boss is not watching, if, if you need it, it could be a secret vote. Okay, 56 people, I think that's the, I think that's the, that's the right count. I have a rich vocabulary. I have a rich vocabulary. So be honest, what do you think? Like, compared to the other people that you know, do you use different words? Do you tend to, do you think that maybe, maybe you did more reading in your life than other people did, kind of? Okay, yeah. So eloquent, <laughs> eloquent people here. I believe art is important. So generally, you know, would you invest, do you see the beauty in art if something is, superfluous in an economical sense, but it can still be beautiful and it's valuable. All right, great. Uh, artistic. I have a couple of paintings that I need to sell though. And, uh, <laughs> and okay. no, it's horrible. All right, so why, why am I asking all of this? I, there's one more question I need you to answer is, what is the best in life? And it's not to Defeat your enemies, see them driven before you, and hear the lamentation of the land. All right. So what, what do you think? A lot of these things are important, but if you had to single out one of them, what would it be? Cool. So it's finding love and surrounding yourself with friends. Nice. All right, so this is probably... This is probably a picture you will see if you ask all kinds of people, and this is, these are the motives that people tend to put forth 
most. It's a sense of belonging in a way. Is it family or is it friends? But feeling loved and belonging is really important in our lives. And you don't see this advertised that much, uh, but there's a strong urge in people to, uh, to be a part of a community. Um, so why am I asking you all of these questions, seemingly unrelated questions? Well, the point is, all of these questions that, um, that I asked answer two basic questions. What do people really want? And who people really are? So what do people really want? If you look at the hierarchy of needs in a sort of evolutionary sense, these are the basic drives. It's immediate uh, physiological needs, obviously, but then there's a self-protection, affiliation, status, mate acquisition, mate retention, and parenting. And it seems really maybe drab or, 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 or too biological for us, but all of these motives actually define who we are, what we strive for, and the way that we interact with the world. In different stages of our life, in different conditions that we encounter, different parts of this hierarchy will be uh, activated. So if we're hungry or cold, we will be interested in that part. But if we feel that we're being rejected by a group, uh, studies have shown we tend to behave more, um, uh, we tend to conform with the group norms more. Uh, teens that have been segregated from the in-group tend to dress more like the in-group. They want, they want to conform with the group. Mate acquisition is very important once you hit uh, teenage years. Before this, when you're a kid, it's completely irrelevant. Uh, mate retention in, in, in the end, it's all actually parenting. So in Domi, like, because it's a higher, it, it looks like a hierarchy because it's a triangle, it doesn't mean in order to be happy in your life you have to be a parent. For most people, it redefines their life. Uh, but it's not necessarily, there's a lot of individual differences. And while, while we are at the individual differences, we get to the question of who people really are. Now, I've talked to a lot of designers. I've talked to a lot of architects. I've talked to a lot of people that spend their life designing the environment in which people live and in which people, with which people interact. And they are all struggling to ask the right questions to build the the environment so it would suit the person and they try to figure out what is the thing that divine sort of what is the thing that that defines the person you know what are the basic traits that a person is and how do people vary well psychology actually has an answer to this so there's a, a theory it's called the lexical hypothesis and it sounds really boring but the basic idea is like this. They said, if there's an important trait of a human being, it will get coded in our language. So we will have a word to describe it, because this is why language is for. It's made basically, mostly for describing people. 30% of our lexicon is not things, is not actions, it's traits. 30% of words ever, that ever spurred to, to life describe other people. That's how that important, uh, 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 that's how it, important it is. And when you analyze all these lexicons and you run them through a statistical analysis called the factor analysis, you get the basic human personality traits. And the basic human personality traits are actually what we went through before. So I feel comfortable being in the center of attention. I get up, uh, upset easily. I try to make other people feel comfortable. I leave my things everywhere, I have a rich vocabulary, and I believe art is important. All of these uh, statements are taken from a personality questionnaire, and they target these big five personality traits plus intelligence. Now these big five personality traits <coughs> plus intelligence have come under a certain media scrutiny in the last maybe couple of months because these five personality traits is what Cambridge Analytica was trying to get from you. And why this is so powerful, I'm, trying to, I'm gonna try to explain later. So their names are, so it's extroversion, 
like how open you are and how, how, how much do you seek social interaction? And people differ in this. You can, you can actually study extroversion in squid, in tons of other animals. Some are really social, some are not. The other trait is emotional stability. Some people tend to get, are edgy, get upset easily. Some people are just smooth sailors. And the point that what I'm trying to make is, there's not one good way or one good personality. All of these make sense if you look at the whole picture. So let me give you an example. Emotional stability is tied to the motive of, let's say, mate retention. So a highly uh, neurotic or emotionally unstable person will use a strategy for mate retention that suits their personality. And that would be constant surveillance. Where are you? What are you doing? You gotta call me for one. But if you're high on another trait, which is agreeableness, how friendly and caring you are, you're gonna approach your mate differently. You're gonna shower her with gifts. This is how you, uh, this is how you keep a mate. So personality interacts with our basic motives and makes us who we are. Another one, conscientiousness. How diligent are we? How dedicated to finishing the project that we started? Conscientiousness is the best predictor of life success after college or even before college. Your IQ will get you to college. Your conscientiousness will get you out of college and let you lead a, a, a healthy and productive life. Well, kind of. If you're highly intelligent and creative, and you find an uh, outlet, like a creative uh, uh, agency, you might get uh, ahead by being disorganized but really creative. And it's a trade-off we make. So each pole of these personality traits has its own strengths and weaknesses. And depending on where we are on these um, um, factors, we'll, we'll actually be uh, uh, charting our, our life course. And there's a, there's a way that we can use this later. Intellect, obviously, it's only a proxy of your intelligence, but yeah, reading you know, a lot of books, being, being willing to um, uh, learn is, is a, like a proxy of intelligence. And openness to experience is a really interesting uh, trait. It's tied to uh, intellect. And it's one of the, one of the questions that, that targets uh, openness is, if you go to a restaurant, do you order the same thing over and over again, or do you try new things? Are you willing to listen to an argument of a person that doesn't agree with you, and listen and process this and maybe change your mind, or are you being very dogmatic about your, about your uh, uh, views? And as you can imagine, this is a great predictor of political, uh, uh, of your political attitudes. People that are less open to experience tend to be more conservative. People that are open to experience tend to be more uh, liberal. So what do people really do? So this is where all of this pours down into your domain. So people, uh, they leave a trail. Our personalities and our, le uh, our needs leave a trail in our everyday life. Uh, and what do I mean? If you were a, a biologist, an ornithologist, and you saw this nest, you could tell tones about this bird. You could see it's a swamp bird. You could tell a lot about its uh, predators from the color of the eggs. You could tell a lot about its food feeding practices, uh, about its relative size, about the mating, uh, mating strategies of males and females. You can tell a lot just by looking at this image. But what if I told you that you can do the same by looking, for instance, at your desk? And it's not a guess, it's a study that has been, has been done over and over again. You take snapshots of people's lives, of your desk, of your room, and you show it to other people and ask them, well, can you, can you rate these people on the, on the big five, on the big five personality traits? And they can, and you guess what? They're pretty good. Just looking at the trails that we leave, you can tell a lot. Let me tell you an example. If you're an extrovert, you want to talk to people, right? A solitude is pain. So what do you do? You put all kinds of shit on your table so people will come there and play with it. <coughs> you put a ball of candy 
on your table. So people go there and you know eat the candy and then you get to ask them about their family and tell about yourself a bit and all of that stuff. And then an introvert, he's gonna stare at you know, he's gonna turn to the wall and just look at the wall and just please don't don't. You know, probably have a little let a little don't talk to me sign up there and just leave me alone. So in, in, it's actually a, a great study has been done by uh, a personality psychologist called uh, Sam Gosling, not Ryan, not Ryan though. Uh, and he did he did a great study where he went into the do into dorms. He had people agreeing to participate, and he would just barge in like stupid times a day uh, and just take a photo of the of the room, and then he would give them questionnaires of personality to you know for them to fill, and then. He would give the photos, as I said before, he would give the photos to strangers and just say, you know, tell me about this person. You see his room, tell me about him. And people were really good at judging people just by looking at the trail that they leave. So what I'm saying is, <coughs> everything that we do, it, we leave little bread marks and we, we show who we are. But it's not only involuntary, we do it voluntary. So looking at the, uh, at the peacock, so that was the biggest problem for Darwin. He was developing the theory of uh, sexual, uh, of uh, natural selection, and it just did not make sense. Like, why would this bird have all these feathers? I mean, it's expensive to build. You gotta eat a lot of food, you know, to maintain it. If the predator comes, you're not gonna be able to run away. You're basically calling him to eat you. It's, it's insane. But then he figured out there's another game at play, and it's called sexual selection. And it's basically signaling traits that you're a good mate. So what the peacock is actually doing, and if you analyze the colors um, and the complexity of his tail, you can tell a lot about the mate. You can tell if he's high quality mate, if there's a high parasite load, if he gets enough nutrition. So it's basically his uh, bank account. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, you know, it's like the keys of the Merc, right at the table. So he's showing, look at me, I can survive with this big ass tail and still be here to chat with you. <laughs> this is how good of a mate I am. But what I'm, the, the argument that I'm making, everything that we do, every post that we put on Facebook, every picture on Instagram, everything we do in digitally, we not only leave our trail, which is what Cambridge Analytica was all about, we actively signal who we are, so we attract people that have similar uh, worldviews and attract mates that are of similar bank value to us. And we did great studies on Facebook where we were looking at profile photos. I did not steal your data, by the way, it's, uh, it's consensual. <laughs> um, and you saw like men uh, signaling high status, which is attractive to females, females signaling youth, you know, there was sort of. Uh, uh, use the filters to make their uh, eyes a little bigger and their skin a little uh, softer and all of this. And even on Instagram, we did studies where we showed that, you know, if you have more followers, people tend to uh, rate you as, as more of a high status person. So the need for us to get more followers, the need for us to put the profile photo on, you can trace it all back to this basic need to signal who we are so we can navigate better through the social world. And this is a great example of sexual selection. So can you guess which, which is the female, which is the male? Let me, let me help you. The scared shitless is the male. <laughs> so much of the uh, 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 dominant males. So the female here is looking at the nest that the male has built, all right? And she, I mean, so he built all of this and he, it's, it's really elaborate, it's, it's the birds of paradise. And he, you know, brings in different colors, makes different mounds, it's, 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 it's crazy. And he calls for the female, and the female goes in and she looks at it, judges it, you know, judging, watching always. If she doesn't like it, she demolishes everything and flies away. Not only does she leave, she's like, why did you waste my time on this pathetic piece of mess? I'm going away. So you can imagine how terrified he is. So he's trying there, he's building his nest, you know, he's, he's gathering his followers, he's trying to put the image out. And you know what the best part of it? This is not even a nest that you build, that you put your eggs in. It's just for display. 
So, but what is he displaying? Well, he's saying, you know what? I can take time off a day and spend all of this time and energy in flying around and find, finding blue shit to put in your goddamn nest that you, you think is so cool. So this is the point. He's showing I can do it. I'm a high quality mate. And it's a proxy for fitness. So sexual selection kind of veers in these weird kinds of ways and, and shows all kinds of this weird behavior like compuls compulsively putting on Instagram stories. Uh, so the point is, this was the tipping point. Uh, I was talking about the trails and the signaling, and we do this, and we do this in real life, but the argument that I'm making is, and that has been proven, is we do this even in the digital environment. Even when we move from the real world to the imaginary world of the internet, our biology just shines through. In this paper, was actually the tipping point where people behind Cambridge Analytica started looking at personality because uh, Kaczynski and his, and his co-workers found that if they look at your Facebook data, what they did was they built an app called My Personality at the Cambridge Data Science um, um, uh, Lab. And they gave you the personality questionnaire and you filled it out. But then they took all of your likes and everything that you did on Facebook and it turns out that just by looking at your likes, they were able later to predict personality of the people better than the per people that really knew that people. So the, the matching of the, of the personality um, uh, um, uh, profile that you had from Facebook was better matched to your personality than people that knew you. And you get all kinds of weird stuff like if you like Wu-Tang Clan, that's the biggest predictor of heterosexuality. If you like Hello Kitty, you're most likely to be uh, African-American female liberal. Um, weird stuff, I don't know, it's weird. Um, if you like guns, you tend to be more, uh, more of a conservative, but in, in pickup trucks. But uh, some of these make sense, some, some, of them, some of them really don't. But it turns out the stuff that you like and the trails that you leave and the signals that you put out define you. And how do you use this? Well, you use it in a new tr in, in a new field that's called psychographics. So demographic demographics is what you would use when you're designing a product. When you're talking to a client, they would tell you what is your target audience. They would say, well, you know, it's a white male, um, um, age this and this, living in this in the city. But who is he? Can you differentiate more? Can you target better? This is where psychographics kick in. So it's not only a group of people defined by their age and gender, pronoun. Uh, it's, um, it's more of this, it's personality, values, interests. The only reason why we didn't do this before, because it was costly. You couldn't go around giving people personality questionnaires, and now you've got an easy way. You can, you can take all this data, you can correlate it, and you can tell, tell more about the people. So why is Zuck testifying in front of the um, um, yeah, Congressional Subcommittee. Mm -hmm. Because a guy, apart from Cambridge Data Science Lab, took the offer of Cambridge Analytica, built the app again, paid for participants, and in a week, matter of a week, had the same data set and sold it to them. So what did they do? They use the same big five personality traits to target people with the ads. So let's say you're a highly neurotic person and they want you to vote for Trump. So you, this turns up in your newsfeed and says, there's been 5,600 break-ins in your neighborhood in the last five years. And they're trying to take your guns away. <laughs> okay. They're trying to take it away. All right, this, this works for a neurotic person, but if you're, not, if you're not easily scared, you don't care. But if you're an agreeable extrovert that's fond of guns, you get this in your newsfeed saying, you wanna go hunting with your buddies on Sunday? They're trying to take your guns away, okay? You won't be able to do it. So this is the point. And you know what? Let, let me give you an example. Uh, you want to target an extroverted female to buy your makeup. What do you do? So one ad would say, 
there's a dancing girl, and it says, dance like nobody's watching, but they are. <laughs> you want to target an introverted girl, there's an image of a beautiful girl in front of the mirror, and it says, beauty doesn't have to be loud. Boom, 40% more engagement, 50% more conversion in that single ad. This is how, this, how powerful this is. Uh, so tying it all together, like the beautiful rug that was still in the nightmare. So you have all of these traits. Uh, apart from personality that I've talked about, you have also the virtues and the morality. So it's uh, be, ca be caring for other people, caring that you know, uh, there's, there's, there's fairness in the world, people are treat, treated fairly. There's um, a respect for authority, for sanctity, for loyalty. Some people care more about this, some people care less. But if you know these traits, and if you know how they relate to these motivations, you have a very powerful tool in your hands. And I'm not, I'm not asking you to be evil vi villains now. I'm going to show you how you can use it for good, all right? So we have this uh, trait that, uh, we have this app that we selected, sort of. Um, and just to show you, in, in just like a design, how you can implement this, if you knew this about your user, your customer, right? So let's say um, you have um, a kitchen um, a, a food app. So if, if you know that your user is an extrovert, the share button would obviously be more important. If you have a quick and easy option, and you know the information, information of the intellect of your user, like a highly intelligent person can, quick and easy, can be a uh, pastare piatta con il um, whatever, right? A quick and easy for low intelligence person is fry an egg, don't burn the house, all right? <laughs> so it's basically giving people what they can handle better. Conscientiousness, dinner for the week. Fuck you, dinner for the week. I'm a low conscientious person. I don't need reminders that I'm unorganized. Put it away. If you're a highly organized person, you're gonna like this. Yeah, dinner for the week. I actually plan for a month ahead, you know? <laughs> or, move it on, like, uh, openness to experience. Look, get inspired. If you're open to experience, you know that people are gonna be willing to try more stuff. So you're gonna put oriental stuff in, put bugs in. If they're high on openness, why not? If they're low on openness, Meals like mom used to make. This is what they want, okay? You can try and introduce new stuff, but basically help them live a good and successful life within the uh, 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 confines of their own personality. Crowd pleasers, extroversion. So for an introvert, if you put the, if you put the uh, newsletter out, put the newsletter out for a dinner for one, dinner for two. If you put a newsletter out for extroverts, 15 people. Party, party food. This, because this is what they like. This is what they seek in their life. Again, shop, shopping lists and conscientiousness uh, taps in the same, taps in the same thing. And there's a lot of stuff, look, look. Uh, status, more important for females than for males. Um, you have a photo of a guy and, 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 a, and, and a girl in a Pinto and in the Bentley. And you ask, actually ask to the people to ask uh, to rate attractiveness on, on, on these photos. So for girls, it actually doesn't really matter. Uh, for guys, it doesn't really matter if, if the girl's sitting in an expensive or, or a less expensive car. For girls, if the guy's sitting in a Bentley, he gets rated, I'll wait for this, more physically attractive. Not more attractive because he's a capable guy, more physically attractive. Same guy, different car, right? <laughs> Look at this. If you if you, you you remember the find a mate motive, so if you show guys photos of attractive girls, they tend to make more stupid financial decisions. Casinos have scaly clad girls touching your shoulders because you're more likely to gamble away your money. This is how we are badly wired. <laughs> this is how we work. So knowing all of these tiny psychological quirks can help you help people make better decisions and actually offer them st stuff that um, will make their life better. Uh, look at this, shopping, shopping uh, and, and girls. As you go through an ovulatory cycle, once you're ovulating, you're looking for new mates or a word, your, your grand, 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 
grandmas, we're looking for new mates. Um, but what has been shown is that once, if, if I would spur the mate acquisition motive in you, you tend to make more unique choices. I would invite you to a lab and say, look, there's 15 chocolates here. Which ones do you want to try? Chocolates, perfumes, uh, dresses, whatever. And you would pick maybe 10 on average if you're ovulating, maybe three if you're not. How does this make sense? Well, look at this. When females are ovulating, they activate a variety-seeking mechanism. Men have all kinds of stuff similar to this. But it's basically a generalized variety-seeking mindset, and it tends to be transferred into your consumer behavior. So if you want to be a particularly unethical wholesale retailer, and you want to get people to buy your house brand, I can track I can track when, when you buy your um, uh, pads or whatever, and I can see when you're ovulating, and I send you the catalog with my house brand, and I will, I will get the conversion up 5, 10, 15% with a couple of million users. That's a lot of money. So knowing biology actually helps people to target you better. But, oh, if you spur, if you, <laughs> if you spur uh, jealousy, in females, let's say, with your ad. So you're designing ads, you present ads to your clients, you want, they want to sell products. But if you can target the ad right, if you target jealousy, women tend to choose products with larger status symbols. So after you show them photos of attractive females, they really like the, the bag with the big Gucci sign. The, the, the big Gucci sign, kind of. It looks better, it just looks better at that point. <laughs> So this is the point, but I'm, what I'm saying is, you can apply it for good. Look, if, you're, if, if you want people to be healthier, if you have a health app, and you want people to go to the doctor, and you know your client is an extrovert, you send him a message, a reminder, you say, go talk to your doctor. If your client is an introvert, you say, go to your doctor between the hours of three and five, there's least people in the waiting room there. <laughs> So these are the kinds of stuff that you can use it for good or bad, but it's super powerful. And it's not only, I'm, I'm giving, what I'm, what I'm trying to translate here is a framework, a powerful framework for understanding people. And you can use this for people that you work with, your clients, your products, and finally, the users. Um, and if you really want to find out about your personality and what Facebook knows about you, you can go and uh, type apply magic sauce. It is a program by Cambridge Data, app, uh, data Labs, which is ethical, uh, and it's going to suck your Facebook data and give you a personality profile. So hopefully you will, uh, you will enjoy it. And this is all for me, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so we have some people that will join me now. I'm gonna have you scooch down just. A yeah, bit. can you help with the with the I, I, I call I call the short one now. So people that are panelists, please come up. You know. Come on, Brian. Welcome. <laughs> <Whoa. Great. laughs> cool. Great. Cool. 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 If I spin this higher, does that say something about? Yeah. Absolutely. Probably real low. And we have one more microphone for questions for people. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm Steve, you guys know me. I help do PMCG and I have a development company and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, who are you? Uh, hi, my name is Anita and I work in the human resources department in uh, company Lemax. Well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Brian, uh, I live in New York City and um, I'm here working for Five this week. Hi, I'm Latka. I'm working as a project manager at Five. Cool. Okay, so who has questions? Please raise your hand. No one has questions. <laughs> okay. Switch it up. 
Yeah. So I have a question about um, the course that psychology is going to take in the future. You said in the last 25, 30 years, it has been geared towards biology. And I see that for now, we're still collecting data through, well, maybe, yeah, we're oh, yeah. collecting data through maybe digital footprints, but also questionnaires. Yeah. And what I'm interested in is um, what do you think, how far are we from connecting psychology and personality traits to m actual brain images and everything that we know in medicine? All right, that's a, that's, a fan oh, that's a great question. I mean, look, first of all, there's a lot of neuro studies being done now, but and even neuroimaging studies. But at this point, you know, it's like in genetics. Uh, for most of the big traits like intelligence, we know it's heritable, heritable, but we can't find it on the genome. So it's 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 a interaction interaction between a lot of genes. So even if you get a, a like neuroimaging now is just you know you get a, a piece of brain that lights up. It's basically blood rushing into that part of brain and, and all kinds of stuff. But we do know for most of these personality traits, we we sort of have an idea of their neural background. But what you said about where where psychology is heading. Um, and I think that is the most important question at this point because, you know, I'm teaching at the university and you, you have these same old, same old <coughs> things being taught to students. And if, if, you want, if you want me to be completely honest, I don't see, I don't see a real reason for psychology in maybe next 15 to 25 years being separated from, from IT because so much of what we do is going to get immersed in, in uh, a virtual reality and, and our behavior is gonna get de redefined completely with our interaction with, with machines. I mean, the only reason where we're not living like Borg at this point is because we have a, we have a, 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 a narrow bottleneck from our thoughts to the movements of our hands, to typing on the whatever machine we have and going in online. Once we get that out of the way, we are, or blessed, who knows, but we're talking about a whole different psychology and I think that is the future. I think uh, IT people that don't know how to, uh, uh, don't know about psychology and psychologists that don't know how to program, doomed. I don't know how to program that one. <laughs> do you have a Facebook and do you like stuff on Facebook? <laughs> we'll go down the line. Yeah. Um, I do, now less than before. <laughs> and I had a conversation with a friend a few days ago about that and how you know the government is targeting us, she's very suspicious and I'm not. And then I realized, but maybe by not posting stuff on Facebook, I am actually suspicious because they're going to be wondering about me. All those people who post everything about their lives, they're transparent, like they're not suspicious. So I decided to post like fake posts once a week, like me <laughs> at the <a> supermarket. <laughs> yeah, it's a joke. Yeah, that's, that's actually great. Somebody, somebody <laughs> said, you know, don't go away from Facebook, confuse them. Like, you know, go like George Michael and uh, whatever. Uh, 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 some like Thompson, <laughs> or, you know, just go, it, it confuse the algorithms. Um, I do use Facebook. I, I like it. Um, I created my own eco space there, and um, it's a it's an echo chamber that I, I like. Um, and it, for for us, for my for what I do, it's it's great. I mean, I can talk to professors and, and scholars from all around the world. I use it with my students because I think it's the best platform for sharing data. Um, so yeah, I do use Facebook plus. And I don't think what the, I don't see what the big deal is, although because you know people, it's a private company that we all agreed to use. Uh, you know, people were not shocked with you know Edward Snowden's uh, revelations that your government is spying on you, but a private company is suddenly held liable for this. So no, I'm not being paranoid. I love using Facebook. Cool. Uh, yeah, I also use Facebook. Um, I did go and uncheck a bunch of boxes for like where my data was going from apps that I had no idea what they even were. But um, the one interesting thing about like ad targeting in Facebook is I have an Instagram, which is Facebook, um, for my dog. 
and they definitely think like my dog is like a mid fifties woman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's like yeah, that's that's just how the algorithms go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm I have Facebook account, but I don't use it that much as I did before, which I can an analyze. Maybe I'm you know hearing all these things, so I transfer to Instagram, which is actually <laughs> the same thing. So I'm still still online. But uh, I wanted to mention before I forgot uh, the the part with the apply source uh, thing is that uh, I just remembered when you were talking about that that um, th there's a movement called uh, Time Well Spent. It's a, a non-governmental organization and it was like triggered by one designer who was actually frustrated with how we do UX and UI design. Like, do we actually make applications that serves us well for our well-being, or are we making users spend time more on screen and, you know, do stuff that business wants? And it's an interesting, especially if you are working in, in you know, developing mobile apps, and then when you hear that, it's like a, I would even say, like, moral question, you know, what am I doing all day? Because you understand the, the frustration that he's talking about. Like, um, is the number of followers like something that a creative person really needs? Or maybe someone who wants to be more creative. So if he gets less likes or less followers, how is that actually uh, you know, motivating him to be more creative? Or is he maybe giving up? So um, it's all in terms of intent. You know, what do we want users to do? But then again, uh, the problem that when I was hearing all this, especially the question, who are we or people, something like that, it was like, okay, who are our end users? And on the other end, who are our clients? Because, you know, the clients have different needs and goals. And on the other end, you know, you want to do the best for your end users. And I think that's a challenge. So to combine what you said and to combine what we need to do, it's, it's a challenge, and a psychology will definitely help well, us. If, if I, I mean, there has to be, well, I'm, I'm not for regulation at, at all, but, and, and you see, you know, I, I believe human nature is the, the divided, it, you know, in, in certain conditions it can be very harsh and, 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 and cruel, but <coughs> we, we basically, as you, you, you displayed your needs, you know, you all want to belong, you all need love, and you're not special in that way, I, I think it's a, it's a need for, mo for most people. And uh, sometimes, you know, sort of the, the even the app market will, will regulate itself. And uh, for me, let's say, okay, there's a, there's a very devious way that the Facebook app is designed. So when you refresh it, it shows you new data. And this is, I mean, this is shown to be very ad addictive for 60 years in psychology. The way, you know, the, the, uh, the slot machines are designed. Like they drive you to do it because you never know what's going to happen. This is the same swiping in the app, but also like the free free market uh, helps you solve this. Uh, and I, I have very low conscientiousness, and I paid an app that blocks my Facebook for 23 hours a day. And so you know you, you sort of find your way around it. It's I, my my best. I think the best saying that I use is you know from Jurassic Park. Dr. Ian e. Malcolm says. Life always finds a way, and that's true. I mean, I, I think in the end, um, um, all of these, all of these crutches that we use are only crutches, and, and, and human nature will sort of chart a, a way for itself. We have another question from the audience. Yes. yes. Um, you can give, like, can you give an example from your life or company or project or anything how you use the psychological data or any kind of analysis? So we can also get a maybe or inside how to better use it with the purpose? Yeah, I for sure did not do that. I just built stuff, like engineers build stuff, and then it, no one wants it, and that's why like 90% of startups fail, because they don't actually do user experience or surveys or anything like that, so don't do that. Definitely find out who your users are, and find out the problem that you want to solve, and then worry about solving the problem first. Don't just build something. So fi find out the problem, find out who has the problem, how they experience that problem. People experience problems differently. Did you, like one word? Yeah. Um, sometimes you don't need a psychologist, and all of you know this. I mean, people have are, are intuitively good <coughs> in, in guessing what other, other people think. That's the that's the basic nature of, of humans. I mean, if this wasn't true, people couldn't write soap operas or or, or novels. You know, people can sit down 
and write hours of hours of conversation between imaginary people and we read it and it makes sense. So we can guess what other people think. The only pitfall of you doing this is not realizing you're a tiny fragment of, situa of, of population and sometimes you can't really guess what the other pe person, person wants. Cool. Um, yeah, I don't think, I've never worked on projects that, um, like you know, we saw examples here where like, you, know, you could build a product and once you know a little bit about your user, or maybe just through you know, the Facebook ads you targeted them with, you know, maybe you make an experience different based on how they get there. I haven't done it to that degree, but even just you know, simple layouts of pages and what's like, attractive to your customer is gonna be very different based on who your customer is. If it's um, a good example, I was working on an app for ordering pizza. Um, and if you watch Silicon Valley a few weeks ago, they mocked it, which is really cool. Um, so that was like yeah, claim to fame there. And um, but they, um, the, we would you know, change background images based on like your location, the time of the day, because if you were looking at this app to order in the future, you might not be as hungry as you are like in the moment, and like different pictures appeal to people differently then. So um, I'd say that like is in that range. But I think there's, um, it's really easy to like. The, you know, Facebook ads to figure out like an introverted versus an extroverted person, you could really just get different funnels of people and really make your experiences very different with um, any sort of web or app product. And I think there's like lots of potential in like really any product to do that, and that's something that I want to do more. Did you A/B test those images? Yeah, we were really heavy on that. Um, that was one thing that the company did a great job in was A/B testing, um, but the the top of the funnel was just a little too small. So. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't think that we have used psychological data, uh, um, otherwise then you know, defining personas or trying to confirm that those personas are right uh, when comparing with the end users that we have. Uh, we use data from analytics and so on, but that's all another topic. But regarding the psychological part, I, I think that in the UX design and the projects, uh, how, how we lead them is basically the, the defining persona, defining that person uh, the perfect uh, um, characteristics of, of someone who is going to use our app. Because I, I think that some clients don't even know how to define that. Like select all, all ages, all genders, all, all uh, professions. And that's a problem because then, uh, as, as Steve mentioned, you know, that's you're targeting the whole world and, and that, that will be a problem. Um, but uh, one, one thing that I, I heard yesterday actually, how maybe not connected to the question, uh, but still it's, it's interesting because I, I was kind of, yeah, right. I mean, you also uh, TV series, series like Friends, and um, there was an, an article about how um, millennials are now responding to that uh, sitcom uh, with horrified uh, comments <laughs> like, gee, who watched this? It was like just 10 years ago yeah. uh, because, you know, they were very uh, homophobic, yeah. So different kinds of situations we saw there, and we laughed. And if you laugh today on the same kind of you know situation, you are like, you said what? Yeah. So it's for me it was interesting to to see how society and technology changed, you know. Uh, and the same thing that was ten years ago funny is not that funny anymore. Yeah. And we are the same or not. Yeah. <laughs> That's, if I could just for That's a great example. I mean, and, and the, the, the psychographics that I told you, it's not a silver bullet. I mean, liking a show at one point in your life and then that show turning into something else uh, means completely different. So a person, a millennial that likes the show could be, okay, this is the free speech kind of guy. Yeah. Uh, before, if you liked Friends, it's, it was just like, yeah, you were mainstream and you like Friends and you're an agreeable person who likes, you know, humor or wh whatever. So it's a problem even for companies like Cambridge Analytica looking at, you know, at what point in time did you like one thing? What, what does it mean now? What does it mean? Laughing at gay people, like, exactly. try now. <laughs> okay, so we kind of touched on this a little bit, which is um, we can use some of this information for good <coughs> or for evil. So. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of discussion about ethical frameworks for people, product managers, developers. Do you think we need an ethical framework? And like, how, what would you use in order to build that? Uh, do you think that's something that will come? Should developers reject features that they don't agree with ethically? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what? Just a, a little like question. Um, 
I really don't know how, how to answer that question. I mean, when you talk about um, ethical framework, for what? Uh, so, for instance, like uh, if I get a feature and I'm looking at building it, so question one is, should I reject that feature if I don't agree with it ethically? Should the person that is copying a bunch of data where it wasn't expressly authorized, should that developer say, look, I'm not going to do this, it's unethical? So that's question one. Question two is, I guess, how can we as developers and product managers better prepare ourselves in order to answer those questions? Well, um, <laughs> sorry for the hard <laughs> I feel like uh, when we're talking about the digital world, it's everyone has a hunch that something is right or wrong, but you don't. We, we don't really have like any legal frameworks that you can yep. rely on and say, hereby I recall this, you know, law, and according to this, this is not right. I mean, you have your own sense of right and wrong, and our technology is developing, <coughs> developing far much faster than our um, adaptation to it is. So. Just one day you wake up and there's Snapchat, and then who knows what what's coming next, and you don't have the time to adapt. And I think what what you're talking about when you say ethical framework is what I'm feeling when we talk about uh, I'm a user and I'm being targeted by a company based on my personality, and I cannot help but feel that this is kind of intrusive. Yeah. Why do I feel like this? So I work as a psychologist, and what I do is I um, I select candidates for the job at my company. And so when I, uh, I give them questionnaires, like personality questionnaires, and based on that, and based on the interviews that I have with them, I give a report to the team leader, and I tell him or her, look, this is the person that's coming to the team, do you like him or not? And I warn this team leader about certain aspects of this person that are not quite likable or maybe difficult to manage later on. So this team leader now has to adapt his or her own attitude towards this person, his or her own management style. So in what way is this, what I'm doing, different than a company that's trying to sell me a product based on my personality? They're just trying to do their job, I'm just trying to do my job. So I, I cannot really pinpoint as to why I feel like I'm being manipulated by these companies. Um, but I, I do feel, I, I do feel like something intrusive is going on and someone is like peeking into my mind without me even knowing that and that kind of scares me so taking a little darker spin on this topic <laughs> yeah i think a a, a big uh, point there was uh, people willingly come and take the test so that they can work mm -hmm. whereas a lot of this advertisement uh, logic is kind of behind the scenes so i think that there's this like yeah. obviousness about it and kind of openness about it. You are willing to put your information out there when you go to a job interview rather than having it just kind of yeah. taken. Yeah, 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 taken is perfect word. Uh, let's finish this question down the line. We have a couple questions from the audience, but we'll finish this ethical framework question. Right. I, I, I completely agree with, with everything that you said. I mean, there's this, comp, you know, that a part of it is like, I didn't want this. Although like, it can help you, but I, I didn't want it. They always do ask if you want to give out your yeah. information. Yeah, I know. Come on. <laughs> um, and it's, it's hard to say. Um, look, at, at, at this point, when Facebook was developed, I mean, it, it was used for malicious purposes. But the developers didn't have this in mind. And so you have to take this into account because it can go very wrong very soon, and nobody really envisioned this. Uh, and this is. This is the point, like, can you be held accountable for something that you did, thinking it will go one way, and then later it, it, went, it went the other way. And, and then a lot of things, you can interpret yourself as being more, I mean, to be super extreme, like even, you know, the sort of war criminals had their own view of how moral that was. And this is, I mean, you're, we're tapping with technology you're going basically against human nature, and this is a super hard question. We don't know what morality is. And, and what we know about morality at this point is that, A, it's very tribal. So if you think of somebody as part of your group, you can be the best person ever. If you, do, if you feel they're not a part of your group, if you feel threatened, um, if you at any point think it, it might, um, they differ from you, you can be the cruelest person in the earth. And it might not be even like a conscious decision. It's just a fact of life. You don't have enough capacity to, to be um, uh, 
uh, good, equally good to everybody around you, like your family, your brother, or your sister, or anybody like you. And then another thing is, there's a there's a big discussion on evolution of religion now. That's a big that's a big question in evolution psychology. And some arguments say that the reason why we built civilization as it is because we had this idea of a big morally concerned uh, surveilling God, and then every moral transgression was punished or could be potentially punished in the afterlife or anything like this. And there's a that's a big argument. But it translates in today's society. And it basically shows that, sure, people are moral, but not all the people all the time. And sometimes, although I'm really against regulation, really, uh, sometimes you need somebody to say, OK, this is good, this is not good. Most of us will agree on, if you ask people what is good, what's not good, we'll agree uh, to a different extent. But we sort of know what's right and wrong. I mean, the whole judicial system depends on everybody sort of kind of knowing what's good and not, we, we didn't, you didn't read the Constitution when you were born saying, well, I can do this, I can't do that. We sort of know what's good and what's not good, but you need somebody, you need somebody at one point saying what's good. And, and this is a whole bunch of problems because who is that person? Who is going to be the arbiter of good and bad? And I, th I think nobody has an answer to that. Yeah, I think for um, kind of like any engineering or product decision, like ethics has to be part of your decision making process. Um, like if you're a civil engineer, for example, and you're designing a building, you can make that building a lot cheaper and a lot cheaper by <laughs> taking more and more steel out because steel costs money, and you know, and that makes an unsafe situation. So um, even though you know it, it might hold and you know, get people in there, um, you're not necessarily breaking any laws until it collapses. Yeah. So um, ethics are like an important part there, but it's the same in you know, software. Um, well, I was recently working on a project, and um, you know, I don't think it necessarily crossed any ethical lines, but this came up where we wanted to have like search results and list restaurants, and we wanted to like sort them on quality, but we didn't have much quality data on these restaurants, and we were working with Foursquare, and they said that they can give us like star rating type of things for all restaurants, whether or not there was even a star rating on Foursquare, and the way they would get it was since everyone had Foursquare on their phones, um, it's a little different than the US. You can, it's a lot easier to like track people on their phone apps and all. I know that there's different laws around that here. But um, if, they, if someone went into a store and they had Foursquare on their phone, um, the Foursquare would know they went there. And since Foursquare was also hooked up to their payment systems, they would know the average tip that people left. And they would use that as a means of getting star ratings. And they said, like, oh, cool, like, well, we can give you star ratings. But for us to give you star ratings, you need to um, put the SDK into the app so we can also see payment information within your app so we can get a better sense of the data. And uh, we made a decision not to do it. Um, part of it was we said, like, well, someday the shit's going to hit the fan. They're going to get hacked, and we don't want our name in there. Oh. But, um, <laughs> but that's like one of those things that like, the ethics really um, you have to use that in your decision-making process. And even that, you can consider that just like kind of the capitalist, like you made the best like, business decision because there's a risk of it failing. But, um, but we made it because we felt best about it. Hi, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, first I would answer on your first question, like, no, because someone has to deal with that, I mean, or take care of that. I mean, if, if GDRP probably will solve certain issues regarding the privacy, so things are happening in that direction as well, I would say. Uh, but I have also an example of where you could, you know, maybe ask yourself, like, am I doing a, a right thing with this app? So maybe some of you have heard at five we have done one um, app for for storytelling for kids uh, called Moonlight, and um, it, it was it's basically you're projecting the image on the wall, and from the app you're reading the the content, the story. So when we were working on the project, it was like a cool thing. It looked nice magical and so on and then I started to read the Facebook uh, comments of moms, dads, people and then they said like great, some of them, like great so more screen time in bed for kids like they can't even you know drag them from the tablets and, and, and just mobile phones during the day so now we are going to bed with the phone um, what do you say? and I was like okay they have a point uh, and when we were designing, it was, um, I'll be honest, like it was a constant, you know, discussion with designers who want to make things magical and nice and, you know, attractive and, and sticky. Uh, and actually that app doesn't have to do that because projection is on the wall. So leave the app to be boring and without any, you know, nice things, glitzy, glossy. 
Um, so, so those situations are so some where maybe we can ask questions like, okay, should we maybe you know uh, use moral and, and, and ethic uh, and decide to you know put the time well spent for the user being. We should target those people with different ads than the rest of the audience. Full circle. Can yeah, one, one more quick question. Go for uh, it. Uh, can I just say one quick thing um, yeah. regarding the whole ethic and ethical thing? Uh, I feel like, well, it's much more difficult to, it's much easier to do immoral things online in the digital space where you don't have really, you're not in touch with the consequences of your behavior. Like, it's much easier to cyber bully a person, to write something nasty on their wall, than to approach them and tell them in person, in their face, that you think something bad of them. So, I feel like when it comes to moral questions, and we're talking about any digital space, we are, we are not so good. This whole intuition of what is right and wrong kind of starts falling apart, I think. It's much more well, well, difficult to, to remain ethical, and we don't even know what that means. Like, why would using someone's data be unethical? It's not really clear. It's not like you're really harming them, you know? And I think it's much easier to slip into this whole unethical thing. And I, that's why I feel like we have to discuss about these things. And I am pro GDPR, although I'm not really familiar with what it exactly is, but initiatives like that. I feel like we do need something that's gonna come on top of us and tell us, hey, you should be careful. Because I don't think that we are capable of doing that on our own, intuitively. Yeah, well, for, for <laughs> we just hijacked the For call. scientists, it's, it's, it's <laughs> simple. Like, psychologists, yeah. hashtag. Yeah, for, for psychologists <laughs> in science, we just write the project proposal and we send it to the ethical committee. And they say, it's fine, I don't have to worry about yeah. it anymore. That's their fault. One word answer, should companies have ethical committees that are software companies, yes or no? Yes. <laughs> One word. No. Oh. Oh uh, yes. First thing, no. Like. Yeah. Right. Use Go your for brain. It. Use it and use your brain. I, I almost forgot the question. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, uh, Igor, congrats on, on uh, delivering great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Can we give him a little bit? This is not a paid advertising. <laughs> 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 Questions, not stories. I see that all of us enjoy this topic. Uh, I have a weird question. Um, uh, I suppose that because you study uh, uh, human uh, psychology, evolutionary yep. uh, psychology, uh, you study human motivation on an individual level. But what do you think? What is your thought? How are motives on a species level? Oh yeah, I mean the, the motives that I the motives that I um, so the, the are outlined in the, the hierarchy that, that I showed there are motives on the species level, but the way that, that they get played out in the real world is actually interaction between these motives, the life situation somebody's put in, their personality, and of course there's a big, big factor. I mean that's culture. Um, people don't like to talk about it. Like I work on this interaction between, on the edge of anthropology and psychology. And in culture, we all know, if I, I told you what culture is, you would, you would sort of have an idea of what I said. But if you study culture and psychology, it's super hard to define, like, like a set of norms and behaviors, but where does one end and when does one, another begin? Uh, so yeah, on, on species level, if you want to look at species level, this is the motivation that I um, outlined there. But once it gets translated to real world behavior, it goes through the culture filter and then personality filter and then immediate situation filter, which is like, are you hungry? Or is your mating module being activated because you're a single and there's attractive girls around you? And that in the end ends up being your, your, your behavior uh, or your primary motive, <coughs> let's say. I hope I, hope I answered. Uh, another question. Button up. Switch the button up. Yeah, I actually have a question uh, in response to uh, Anita's previous answer to the previous question. You said that you feel uh, a company is using your person like the information about your personality to sell you something as intrusive. Mm -hmm. So I just want to give you a counter com comment, so to speak. So, for instance, I mean, 
We have ads all over the place yeah. and we have to see them. I prefer to see relevant ads even if I have to give away my personality information. If you, if you know what I mean. So it's a different angle. Like for me, I mean, I'm still divided about this like privacy issues and all that stuff because I, I wonder if it's like needed. Because from, in, from my point of view, if you go online, like you're already giving away like your privacy. And then where is the line? I don't even know if there should be one. Like if you're, if you're online, you're sharing. And if somebody is using that to sell you something, I don't really see it as such a bad thing at the moment. Maybe I need to have a, something bad happen to me online. <laughs> yeah. So it's not a question, more of a comment. Like, so. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And on the one hand, I do feel manipulated and in, intruded upon. On the other hand, I think it's kind of cool, so I'm confused as to why am I feeling manipulated. Also, I really like it when YouTube suggests a good video to me. I'm like, yes. You know, I kind of enjoy it in a, in a masochistic way as well. So I don't really know what, what to say. I, I do know that it's kind of scary that some app or some company knows stuff about me and according to that, they can sell me something. I think I'm more opposed to the selling part than to knowing me part. Yep. That says a lot about my political views, I guess. Okay, like yeah, yeah I, I would short. say... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, I would say like when we get something we want and help us, we all like it, but then yeah. something like, oh my god, they're using my information. Like, yeah. yeah, it's just like by accident I typed something and then the next thing I know there's an ad and I'm like, why? I don't want that and then I'm annoyed, but when there's a good suggestion, I'm like, yeah, that's cool. Or you said it. Because for or you then said there, it. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's even more <laughs> that's freaky. I know, because I have yeah. a very concrete example, like uh, Google uh, sent a message to my brother we were like having coffee, waiting to go to the airport. Hey, you have to leave 15 minutes, uh, like in 15 minutes if you want to be on time because of the traffic. So he calculated everything. I'm like, man, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I, I don't mind that. I think we need to preserve the sense that we have privacy. And when you don't know to what extent the information you give about yourself is being used and then used for, being, for you being targeted, I think that makes us uncomfortable because when th this whole thing happens in the in the public space, you know, we like to keep our own personality to ourselves and the people that are close to us. Close to us, I think there's a private sphere and then there's the public sphere. And when my personal stuff leaks into the public sphere, I think it's only natural that we that we feel scared. It's just interesting to explore as to why do we feel scared if there's no need to. Yeah, just like a, a second. A second. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think. Instead of regulation, why I said no, like instead of regulation, I think education is, is a better way to go. And okay, sure, don't hide the privacy option somewhere deep, deep, deep in your app. Uh, and just educate people, it's gonna be fine. Because once you don't get the targeted stuff, a lot of people will get annoyed. Like I, I use Mixcloud, and I put a, a, like a, a list of five tracks, and they have, I guess they don't figure, haven't figured out how to track me, and the sixth track is so crappy that I get annoyed. Like, how do you not know what I like? It's like, can, you, can I give you more info on, on what I like? So people are being very comfortable, but if, if, they, if they have a feeling of safety and, and knowledge of what they're doing, I think it'll be fine. Sounds like a okay. Last question. Last question. <laughs> One. Sorry. Oh, okay. A lot of questions from my answer. Yeah. <laughs> How does it not know already? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, yeah, yeah, you have the mic, just so switch it up. About, about new technology and everything about that, but I think uh, when we are speaking about uh, profiling people, which model, what model we use, what model Facebook use uh, when we are using uh, um, human resource, uh, what are good books for that? and how far we are going from Freud or we are still there. Okay, so what books would you recommend or which authors would you recommend to just kind of read up on models for uh, profiling people? Okay. I think you will be better at answering that. Yeah, um, so the, we, we've gone a long way since Freud. I, I, I love Freud and he had wonderful insights in, in human nature and, and I just, I had a lecture on, on university by how, how, how Ideas from Freud, which ideas from Freud are still, you know, you can use today. But the, the model that they use is called the Big Five. So it's called the Big Five Personality um, uh, Model. Um, and there's a lot of books on it. Let's say if you wanna, if you want a gentle introduction into this, it would be the the what is it called the the Snoop, 
uh, is the book that uh, Sam Gosling did, and he used the Big Five. So that's a great introduction to to that. Uh, that's, that's a great book. And then let, if you want to use, if, if you want to learn about consumer behavior and Big Five, there's a great book by Jeffrey Miller, and it's called Spent. So he talks about evolutionary psychology and how it translates into consumer behavior, but he he drags it through the big five personality. So it's called Spent. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great book. And if you want to know how to hook up users, you know, like, read the book Hooked. <laughs> Hooked, Spent, Scoop. <laughs> Simple but... Okay, uh, I am going to ask one final question. Sorry, audience members that have more okay, questions. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, last question. Do you think that the, the whole uh, reviewing and giving grades from customers will change in next five, ten years? Is that, is that power? Again? What? what was the question again? If the ratings and the power that customers have regarding uh, products and services will change. There's a great Black Mirror episode oh, called yeah. Yeah. I was to say that. And uh, I'm not saying that that's coming, but that's coming. So. Yeah. Uh, I feel like you have a burning desire to go. <laughs> There's actually, in China right now, they have the, the rating, of the rating of the people, kind of, which is very Black Mirror-ish. No, but I don't think it will go away uh, because, look, we want, we want to have feedback. We want to have feedback on everything. We want to have feedback, Black Mirrorish, on other people's personalities. This is something that we had when we were in like, this tribal uh, environment. Now it's really hard. And we track it through gossip, through words that we use and say, that describe long-term personality traits. And no, I think it was... It hit the right spot, you know, having Foursquare, having Yelp, which is, if you ask anybody in the service uh, who, who, who provide the service, they hate it because people are horrible. And sometimes, you know, there's a neurotic and it's not reliable. And human psychology is there's 5,000 positive reviews and one negative, and you're like, what did that guy say? <laughs> you know, you're not thinking he's an outlier, it doesn't matter. So, yeah, it has its pitfalls, but it's not going away. Um, and we might find new ways and re more reliable ways on, on, on rating people and we'll have more diversity there going away. I really doubt it. I really doubt it. Uh, yeah, I definitely agree. I think though, um, like, you know, kind of Adam Smith capitalism, like the free market will take, you know, will get rid of the creepy things. But, um, but people want information. Like people really crave information in the decision making processes. I don't think like, you know, that part is ever going to go away. Like finishing punchline, right? Yeah. I know. Like use apps and use your brain and <laughs> yeah. take care. You, I mean. I need to, yeah. Okay. Brave new world ahead of us. Yeah. Final <laughs> question. We, can, we cannot stop technology and then business will always follow technology, so I don't expect apps to be, you know, ethical that much. Yeah, so, yeah. Last question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right here. Bring it we got it. Well, more uh, talking for there's a lightning <laughs> round after this hour for sure. Then. Well, I, I don't have so much confidence as you do in uh, common sense. I don't think that common sense applies to the digital world as much as it does in our real world. I mean, we have problems in the real world because we don't agree on what is right and wrong all the time. And so in the digital space, as I said, I think that our intuition about what is right and wrong kind of starts falling apart. And that is, I'm being a pessimist again, a little bit afraid of what, it, what is going to happen with us if we continue with this whole liking and liking. And if a, a bad like, if a dislike can destroy a business, I'm afraid of that kind of world. And I feel like we do have the responsibility to educate ourselves on the consequences of our actions and not take it so lightly. Just because you posted a bad comment, it doesn't mean it's just a comment. It's not just a comment. It has a real impact because it's somebody's business. It's just an example. Yeah. So yeah, I think bl Black Mirror is kind of coming and we need to prepare for it by uh, educating ourselves, yeah. as you said. And also maybe, you know, before we uh, build our common sense about it, we need to rely on, on certain rules yeah. before we actually grow it naturally in ourselves. And, the and th those rules are undefined, right? Yeah, you yeah. need to define them. Uh, okay, now for real, the final question. <laughs> for real. Uh, one word answer again, lightning round. Will we have privacy in 10 years from now? Will we still have privacy? I think, one word. I think the definition of <laughs> Sorry, I can't help it. 
I think the definition of one word. I think, I think we will. We will, but the definition of privacy will change because perhaps the privacy used to be much bigger and now it's getting uh, less yeah. less space. So your answer is maybe. I think we will still have privacy, but we will have less control over it and the privacy will be tighter. In general, no. 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 <laughs> I'm going to go with yes, because I think the pendulum will swing the other way from what we have now. So, uh, Round of applause for our panelists, please. <laughs> Sorry for going over. Thank you very much. Uh, as a reminder, we meet every second Wednesday of every month, so you can find us here then. Uh, we also record all our talks, so if you've missed one, uh, you can find them on YouTube. We usually post them about a month later, so you get an advantage <laughs> by showing up. Uh, everyone, please put your hands in the air. And please keep your hand up if you are currently hiring product or project managers. Okay? And who's got their hands up? Put your hand up if you're current. So there's a couple people here hiring. If you're looking for a new job or you just want a pay raise, go talk to them. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.